Good evening, everyone. I'm Vallabhi, convener for this evening. On behalf of Curating for Culture, I welcome you all to Constructing Personal Archives Finale. Before we begin, I would like to remind you all of some essential logistical requirements. The dialogue will be recorded for documentation and dissemination purposes. We hope that we have your consent for the same. All participants are requested to keep their handles on mute to avoid any disturbance in the recording. Please avoid keeping your web WhatsApp on or mobile phones on sound mode when your handle is unmuted. If it is convenient for you, we request that the participants may keep their videos on during the session. The Google, link, the Google Meet link is only for registered users and should not be shared with any other person without our knowledge. Questions will be collected via the Google Doc and not the chat window on Google Meet to avoid any disturbance. Everyone will not be able to access Google Doc link at the same time, so questions will be collected via chat only after presentations are over. In case you are facing any troubles connecting, please find the live stream on the Facebook page of Curating for Culture. Curating for Culture has emerged out of collaborations and initiatives explored by Ishita Shah across various cities and projects ranging across different disciplines. We are a collective of many diverse individuals passionate about cultural issues and creativity is our hack. I would now request Ashita to tell us more about today's program, the upcoming plans and introduce the moderator. All right. Thank you, Vallabhi. Uh, and thank you all for listening to us patiently, all those of you who are listening to the introductions again and again. I think it's getting grilled into your system. But again, it's in the interest of the new attendees. And as I can see, we have a quite a few list of new attendees for this session. So we must repeat uh, for our audiences. Thank you all and a warm welcome on behalf of Curating for Culture. I mean, it's just been overwhelming and I cannot, I cannot really put it in words to receive this kind of a support. Um, and we have, that is why we have an unwinding session on WhatsApp going on. I think that's become my comfort space to tell how we are feeling about this. But it's seriously amazing to, to e-connect with so many of you from so many different parts of the world and see the interest in this kind of a program, uh, especially because it's the first edition of Constructing Personal Archives. Um, I'll just take a minute to tell you all about Constructing Personal Archives and how it came into being. It's actually a response to the pandemic. And more and more I say it, I think I'm just feeling very uh, good about it that we thought about something like this where people could come together in spite of all the uncertainties around us uh, and not just come together for for any um, any activity in general but to work with what they connect with what they are passionate about um, so such three workshops had happened in April and May um, on, on archiving family histories. And uh, the feedback from, from those workshops was that it was very short and uh, the participants needed a longer time to create a project. Um, so that, that sort of gave uh, Wallabi and me a reason to sit down and plan uh, or program this four month long incubation project program. Uh, and where we basically selected archiving projects out of some 40 entries, we selected 20. Uh, these were from around across the world. Um, and uh, what was interesting is uh, we, once we run the whole show for, for these four months between September to December, we realized how it was first of its kind. And it calls for a public showcase so that all these uh, unheard projects can be activated and collaborations can be sought. Uh, or responses can be received uh, and not remain within our screens and within us 25. Um, so we collectively agreed to curate a public showcase. And then what happened between January and February is quite, it's way more interesting and it's only getting interesting, more and more interesting the more I'll hear everybody's projects. Uh, I think this note also is getting improv, uh, improv sort of revised every session is because every participant has sort of surprises for us one way or the other. Um, so yes, they were working on their own archives and on their own projects because they had set a goal 
but then their goals also sort of seem to have got redefined through the process or through the program which is sort of inevitable as you would expect and uh, what we ended up doing uh, is also think about a compendium or or a publication which gives this digital space or this digital experience a physical form and together we all continued to curate this collective experience uh, constantly so while we were doing our own individual things there were lots of emails going ye chahiye wo chahiye and you know we want this we want that how do we do this uh, so we were literally into each others uh, spaces even though digitally and it's it's an amazing feeling to collaborate like this uh, in spite of what was going around in the country um and then how this two day long finale has been uh, programmed is to keep in mind that we wanted to facilitate new collaborations activate these dormant narratives or these projects and further the discourse around archival practices in india but also in the south asian context and this is in response to the fact that we receive proposals from um, uh, all the way we have come here from us but otherwise from malaysia sri lanka nepal um, bangladesh and pakistan um so it it sort of gave us the reason to believe that yes we have a regional affinity uh, and the south asia is not again a geographical boundary but a more contextual um uh, similarity which we wanted to work with so that's about constructing personal archives and the finale um the compendium which i spoke to you about and we and we really hope that you all would want to have a copy and look forward to it we don't don't want to print too many and keep it a limited edition but surely want to show you all what it looks like so just let me play it uh, a small clip and then tell you about it Is it there is no sound is there meant to be sound here no there's no there's no sound to it so what i haven't spoken about until now in the three uh, expositions of this video is what what comes up at the end uh, is the air mail letter and and the idea is that we want more of you to write about archiving projects either to us or to your friends or to your family members uh, but yes we want the space to grow where more people are planning and making their own archival projects um to talk about the compendium otherwise um the idea was basically to visualize um as we said uh, the experiences of the uh, constructing personal archives 2020 program and sort of memorialize it it turns out to be curating for culture's first self published work uh, hence the form was very important to us and we wanted to keep it true to how you would find things in an archive uh even the un, even the bound books for safety reasons are sometimes opened up and you let the pages be and you know each item speaks for itself um and it's it's this part to whole whole to part kind of a story and the researcher decides and in this case the reader you can decide how you want to read this projects read these projects and how do you want to make relationships between them our structure will hopefully not come in your way the page numbers are very very tiny um on that note i must also sort of reiterate that yes we are a self funded collective and we want to keep doing such initiatives and the more we can do it uh, on a free public access um uh, handle we would believe that more people will be able to join i mean i understand that digital is still not something that everybody is going to be able to access but at least uh, we don't want while we are on digital a certain cost to come in the way so if you would like to support us we are going to share um, the crowdfunding link in the chat at the end so do consider um, contributing whatever it is a little bit also makes a lot of difference um, there are certain slabs under which you can also get a copy of the compendium so you can look into the details of the 
crowdfunding campaign. Now, uh, I must move on to the program and um, introduce, invite Mithul. But before I do that, just a quick rundown uh, how it's going to work is um, Mithul Kajaria, who is the fourth co-curator of this program, uh, will set the context of, of what he thought, why are we here today, and um, how he has seen through these four projects to be coming together. And from there on, each team will take up to 15 to 20 minutes max to present their projects or their experience or their prototype, so that we are left with about 40 to 45 minutes of a thorough discussion. Uh, we had a very intense uh, round in the session three, so we're really looking forward to what comes next. And um, we invite you all to put your questions into the Google Doc link, which we will share with you, or hold on your questions until the presentations are over so that the discussion can happen with you all involved and not just between us. So with that, um, introducing and inviting Mithul. Uh, Mithul Kajaria is an architect, photo artist, and curator currently based in Ahmedabad. A large part of his work is primarily informed by the intersections of his training as an architect, involvement with mental health advocacy, and his social political viewpoint. His recent work, a collaborative installation, The Hari, has been shortlisted for Seoul Architecture Biennale 2021. Mithul played the role of the curator for visual arts at the second edition of Abhivakti City Arts Project, a multidisciplinary public arts festival held in Ahmedabad in 2019. As a curator, he constantly questions the importance of accessibility and the relationship of engagement between an artwork and the viewer. Apart from practicing independently, he works as an associate curator at Satya Art Gallery and with Rangjyot, a fine art print and Sorry, my screen just blanked out. Give me a second. <laughs> and I was uh, reading a fine art print and digitization studio and an archive. So Mithul, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation and co-curating this panel with us. <clears throat> that too, especially on a Sunday night at 8 to 10.30. I think that slot really needs to be commended. For all of you to be here as well, I think we are 53. That's that's a huge round of applause for all of us. Uh, over to you, Mithu. Thank you, Ishita, for that kind introduction. I think I agree I'm overwhelmed with uh, the number of people here on a Saturday on a Sunday night, the 53 people we have here. And uh, I mean, before we begin with the evening, I think I'd like to congratulate you and the team for of curating for culture. Uh, I mean, the initiation and development of a project of a program around personal archives, spanning over six months, working with 20 very diverse projects, and then all of that culminating into this wonderful two-day finale is, is an absolutely commendable job. Congratulations to you. Uh, next, I think I'd like to congratulate all the participants uh, in this session and every and all other sessions. I think I'd worked with you all in September, if I'm not wrong. And uh, now when I see the presentations, the way the projects have shaped up, uh, I think it's, again, an incredible journey that needs to be celebrated. So congratulations to all the participants as well. Uh, moving on, uh, I think when I, I was invited to co-curate and moderate uh, a session, and when I went through the projects, I noticed one underlying theme across all the projects that triggered an inquiry into exploring the relationship of the archivist and the archive. In each of the four projects to be presented today, the archivists share some kind of relationship with the archives, in some cases in the form of an intimate relation with the protagonist of the archive, and others with the archival material that take up the role of memories of their forefathers, or a relationship with the city that they've lived most of their lives in. Now, regardless of their nature, these are relationships that are difficult, if not impossible, to ignore when building a narrative for the dissemination of the archive. This exploration only led to further questions. Can an archive be objective? Does it need to be objective? Can an archive have multiple narratives born from the same source generated from the same set of archival material at different points of a timeline or in the same timeline? Does the relevance or importance of an archive differ based on when it is discovered, worked upon, and looked at?
uh, I think I'm going to pause here and uh, introduce the four projects and the four and the teams and participants presenting today. Uh, we'll begin with calling all witnesses by Kamal Badhe, encounters with an architect by Aarti Mathur and Vishwesh Vishwanathan comes next, which is followed by Gwalior project, Nexus of Narratives and Reminiscence by Saman Qureshi, and we'll end with the Patni Family Archives by Avni Patni and Tana Thiredi. With that, I'd like to invite Kamal and let me read a brief introduction of Kamal. Kamal Badhe is a photographer and documentarian from New York. She is, has an MA in photography and urban cultures from Goldsmiths University of London and an MS in museum education from Bank Street College. Her work intersects with diaspora and origin pilgrimages using photography and family history to stitch together stories. Portals and Passageways follows the path of her jeweler ancestors from Sikandarabad. Kamal's work in accessibility has opened channels to teach with LES Girls Club, Bronx Documentary Center, LTP Tanzania, and Parson Schools of Design, School of Design. She was a 2016-2017 Lewis Hine Documentary Fellow and a 2018-2019 Claremont Documentary Project Fellow. Over to you, Kamal. Thank you, Mithil. Um, can you all hear me? Yes? Okay. <laughs> First and foremost sound. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. I think um, I have actually been to probably half of the workshops because of the time difference. So just um, usually at some point in the workshop, I fall asleep and then I hear Ishita saying, Kamal, are you there? Kamal, are you there in half consciousness? So I just want to really um, thank Ishita and Valabi for having so much faith in me in, in staying with it. And I had some doubts myself and I said, you know, I don't know if I've done adequate research, I've fallen asleep. And so um, today I'm really bringing presence over perfection. And so I think that's um, something that's really, um, I wanna bring with me. I also wanna say that being of the diaspora, I think um, we, I think I'm trying to re-envision not being from here or there, but being from everywhere. And so I think my archival work is, de is deeply influenced by the Black diaspora, the work of Deborah Willis, and also the Jewish diaspora, the work of Marion Hirsch. And so Deborah Willis works a lot with representation, thinking of um, the Black diaspora in the US and photographs, and Marion Hirsch works with the Jewish diaspora, thinking about memory. And so um, both of those thinkers have been foundational to my thinking. So it was really interesting for me to be able to be in a South Asian context and to be able to um, work with people. And I thought it would be a magic pill because I'm working with my family from Telangana. But <clears throat> I think what I've learned most is that how diverse the South Asian context is through all these projects. And so, you know, I was like, oh, I'm actually, you know, me and my family are the expert on our own archive because I thought somebody would be able to tell me something, but I'm like, oh, I actually have to do the work. <laughs> so so, uh, so that was really um, an amazing undertaking. And I teach a class on family archive in the US and we're sitting with people of many different races and cultures. And so it's been really phenomenal for me to just see the workshops and see, you know, how many similarities there are across the globe in terms of people just searching and looking and trying to really see themselves in, in just archival work and just their family. So, and, and so I'm gonna start now with my presentation. Um, one second. This is called Calling All Witnesses. And so I asked you all, where were you during the Telangana agitation of the late 1960s? In a resistance to cataloging images, I invite you to look deeply at photographs of the public gatherings during the time of the Telangana agitation in the late 1960s to see what you can find on the surface of a photograph. Who would you be in these crowds? Zooming in, could you be passing through like these two ladies and this child?
Could you be gathered under a sign like these men? Could you be on your, your way back from school like this little boy? Could you be a woman that came together with other women? Could you be there looking up to cheer aesthetically to the camera? I look at these pictures over and over again, thinking about public space in Seconderabad and Hyderabad, where my family's from. I think about where is the camera? I had a great conversation with Mithul and we were talking about maybe the photographer is on top of the buildings, but there's frequently a lot of pictures in these public spaces where um, people are looking up and they're looking directly at the photographer. I'd like you to meet Nagam Krishna Rao. This is my grand uncle, my great great grandfather's grandson, my relative. So we met each other, it was 2014, but he knew me. I was Rathnamala's daughter. He passed away a few years ago. The images of Hyderabad scene are from his personal album of the movement. So my family work started, I think since I was born, I think just going back to India all the time, just I think memory and photography are very connected for me. So every time I went, I felt very alive being there and I would always be taking snapshots in my head. And then when I had a camera, I started taking pictures too. I also really noticed how visual, visual culture was so strong there. So in 2014, I was searching for the identity and potential migration of my great, great grandfather, jeweler, Anam Rathnaya, and trying to find out where he came from. So um, Anam Rathnaya, was potentially illiterate. He didn't leave any written documents, but he was able to acquire this jewelry shop. So I was really trying to figure out who was he and where did he come from. So I interviewed Nagam Krishna Rao to find out about Ratnaya. So I, this, this is to give a little bit of context of me doing family work. So I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be asking this question about the Delangana movement if I, if I hadn't first searched for the identity of my great great grandfather, Anam Ratnaya. I wanted to know who Anam Rathnaya was and where he came from. I was looking for his origin story. Ultimately, I was looking for my own. While on that journey, the searching was like a river with many tributaries. All the twists and turns led me to goldsmiths who crafted nuanced jewelry, stories from grannies who I now see as feminists, and to the activist Nagam Krishna Rao. He was Anam Rathnaya's grandson, a revolutionary, a freedom fighter, an activist, and a politician for the Telangana movement. The Telangana people had been fighting against oppressive structures that demean the dialect of their language. They were also stereotyped as lazy and excluded from government jobs as their neighbors in Andhra prospered. Their fight was for representation and validation. It's only now I wonder if I follow this stream, it will lead me to land, songs, and the language of Telangana, that I might be brought back to Rathnaya, back to my own speculative origin story. This is my mom singing um, a song from the Batukama Festival of Telangana. This is Nagam Krishna Rao speaking of his journey. So you are really into politics, freedom fighting. Our blood is in freedom fighters. Yeah. I was a, I was a minor. I was the first one after what is action. We had to lose the national flag. Yeah. On the Congress House. Yeah. But my brother want to go. I said, no, you don't go. You run the movement. I'll go and do it. Then I did it and I was in jail. I was a minor in those days. They took me to the, they kept me in jail for 15 days. 
Then after all, they are released. Yeah. I was a freedom fighter. Then afterwards, then I was joined in Telangana station. Yeah. Telangana station. That that was you know that is that street was there. Yeah. The Telangana station, 1969. Yeah. I started the movement. Then I was the president for the second month. Telangana Praja Sabhati. Yeah. That was I was the first MLA from Telangana Praja Sabhati. That was our symbol was uh, when I contested. My symbol was you no. Know, uh, I went to Para. Para. Para good. Uh, the thing which is used to pull the sand and all. Oh okay. That was my symbol. Yeah. I, I, I was against the government. Yeah. That time, this uh, uh, Hyderabad was uh, ruled by the uh, Andhra people. Yeah. And, uh, then Brahmanand Reddy was the chief minister. Then I fought against him. Yeah. And uh, I, we, I won the seat. Then first of all, they, they searched for me. I was, I, I gone underground yeah. for two months. Then afterwards, then I was caught one day. Then they took me directly to the Rajamandi jail. Yeah. In Rajamandi jail, I was in jail for two months. Wow. Then afterwards, then they sent me to Supreme Court, Delhi, Tehran jail. Then the trial took place, and afterwards, you know, I was released Delhi. Then that was when they released me because you know, we have to cross the Telangana border. It is a big movement. And because you know their chief minister has uh, got down, he has resigned. That's why naturally the temperament will be there. And I became to all the way, you see. And uh, that was a big question. Okay, great. Um, so that video I actually took in 2014, and I also took this photograph then. And um, that video is actually, um, I didn't even know I took it really, and I didn't know the information was in my archive in the past and that he had given me some answers to these questions. He's now passed away, so I, I, I'm, I feel pretty grateful to have that. And the video is, the audio is not that great, but um, he's basically telling his story of, you know, just um, being a young activist and that how his brother was also a freedom fighter and how he went to Delhi to do work and that he stayed and decided to work with the Telangana movement. And so um, I put this image that I took. So after I did my own family work in 2014, I created a body of work called Portals and Passageways. And so this is um, symbolic, I think, in many ways of just the working in the archive. So thinking about, um, you know, this young boy in the kitchen who where my mom used to cook and just him going into this hole in this spark of light because I do believe that when we, we are traveling, we are going into a portal and every photograph is a portal as well. So I invite you to look at the photographs of Nagam Krishna Rao returned from his return from jail in the 1960s as a young person fighting in the movement. And I want you to think about what does it mean to put your body in public space during this gathering? And also what issue do you care about so much that you would go to jail for? This is his return from jail. And I think um, in another part of an interview that I did, he said that 10,000 people came to welcome him on his return from jail. And I had to ask myself, what do we know about the Telangana agitation of the late 1960s? So I am calling all witnesses, um, even if you weren't there. So this idea that you can even be a witness in the photograph, so please reach out to me. I left my email if you have witnessed the movement or are interested in witnessing together by going back in time. So um, the movement, it did have some death in it. And so this was translated by my mom. Um, and this was in his album, dedicated to those who sacrificed for Telangana separation. And these are a group of people, these are a lot of students and activists that had gathered. And so um, 
last night, actually, I, me and my mom, I've had this book the whole time, but I don't know what my resistance was to reading it because I really just wanted to look at the photos. But um, I read this to my mom. That's, That's why she wants, she wants to have a piece, piece and she, and she keeps the hand so, so that everybody, everybody will be quiet, quiet for a while. while. Just as the students had begun to boycott exams and the police were firing indiscriminately, she met with leaders of various political form formations and set up two committees regarding public investment and government jobs in the Telangana area. Though the movement was largely peaceful, the police brutality unleashed on the agitators was unimaginable. Armed police from other parts of the country, Malabar, Bihar, Madras, and Uttar Pradesh were amongst the forces that had been deployed. There were not enough policemen in Andhra Pradesh, and anyway, the government did not want to use local police, which it was suspected could be sympathetic to the agitators. With no local sensibilities informing their actions, the police were more brutal than a local police force would be. Could be. Wow, that's really interesting. So the police came from different regions, sir. That's how to stop the agitation, I think. The extent of force used on the agitators had been gouged from the fact that 370 people fell from police to police bullets. Many more were injured and veins. Deaths. Deaths. Do you remember this? 1970, 1969. Yeah, after the madness. You just got married? Yeah, so 69. Many more were injured in Maine. Thousand were put behind bars. And so great was the number of those arrested that colleges like Kakatiya Medical College in Warangal had to be converted into contemporary jails. So that's Nagam Krishna. He was in jail. Some of the agitators were packed off to jails in the Andhra area, like Rajamundi. He, sa he says that in the interview. Rajamundi? Mm-hmm. Wow. Many of those who witnessed the gory days are unanimous in their verdict that violence of this kind could never have been unleashed in the days of television and mass media today. That's what they did not have on Hindi. There was no television? Wow. There were no TVs that there, there was no, only government owned All India Radio. Newspapers were few and in any case there was no national newspaper in Hyderabad. Had it been today, the police could not behave callously as they did and get away, says Guruduri, Gurud, Guduru Satyanarayana, an active participant in the agitations. Were you able to hear it, any of you? <laughs> I'm wondering if I should. Yes. yes. I mean, after the echoing stopped, I mean, while he was, even while it was echoing, it was fine, but once it stopped, it was clear. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, so that was a excerpt from this book that basically told me that there were 373 deaths. And so, um, as I kept on zooming in on the photos, I noticed that, um, there were some illustrations and I, I just thought to myself, sometimes we need to look closely to witness. And even if that looking closely means looking into the photograph, and to remember those that put their life on the line for our cause. So the photograph is actually overexposed, so you can't really see their faces, but these are most likely the people that were killed during the movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamal, for that. Really got me thinking about photograph and how it's not just one object or it's one thing that we realize it is. Uh, moving on, uh, the next presentation the project is called Encounters with an Architect. It's by Arthur and Vishwesh Vishwanathan. Arti is an architect with Pradeep Sachdev Design Associates, New Delhi. She has two decades of experience working with the studio on its hospitality and institutional projects, focusing on design development and architectural detailing. Vishwesh trained as an architect and urban planner. After working with Pradeep Sachdev Design Associates for nearly two decades, he moved to Bengaluru, where he facilitates units related to public space design at the Shishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology. Over to you, Aarti. Thanks, Mithul. Thanks for the introduction. 
Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for being here on a Sunday night. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ishita and Vallabhi for piecing together this great uh, course on archiving. And uh, to say the least, the past six months have been insightful for us, where uh, through the series of workshops and lectures and all the professionals and the experts that you've gotten um, really made us uh, rethink and relook at our material and its purpose. Uh, my colleague Vishwesh Viswanathan uh, and I are collectively doing this project, though he's not being able to present tonight, but um, this project is primarily an institutional project, but in more ways than one, it is personal one too. And I hope that this thought echoes through our intentions uh, and through our project. So I'll straight jump into the presentation now. So the PSTA Studio Archives Encounters with an Architect is a, um, is a body of work that we are, like, we are wanting to present, which are selected works done by uh, architect Pradeep Sachdeva. Uh, as the principal architect of Pradeep Sachdeva Design Associates, or PSDA as what we are known as, Pradeep has been the lead designer, uh, and he was the main designer for a lot of the most of all the projects designed by the firm. Um, PSDA was actually, the inception of PSDA happened in about 1989, where we started in a small studio at the Kidki village in Delhi. And subsequently, we moved to an urban village called Ayanagar on the outskirts of Delhi way back in 2002. This is our studio. Now, just to give a bit of context to everybody over here, I'm just going to run past quickly a couple of slides showcasing the uh, body of work, the range of work that was done by the studio. And uh, some of the studio's key projects, such as Delhi Heart, Garden of Five Senses, both of which are in Delhi, and the various public projects which were done by the office, and its street design projects across India have played an important, an important key role in impacting design practice in the country. In fact, a lot of the road sections that were developed by the office have been turned into public policy and have been made into a guideline booklet as well. Pradeep has designed internationally renowned hotels and award-winning hotel properties across the country that uh, incorporated local crafts, local materials, and local building traditions. That was one of the biggest things that he had always focused on that one was to build with the local materials and inco incorporate crafts and arts in all his projects. Jumping back into the studio, we have, we have always, this is sorry, this is another, uh, several institutional buildings have been made, including a monastery that was made in Karnataka. This is a project which has been very, very close to Pradeep's heart in Sadrana Bagh, Haryana. And there are huge, big, interesting stories behind each of these buildings, which uh, we'll get into maybe another time. Pradeep has always had a keen interest in uh, landscape design, and he was a self-taught landscape designer. He had a great knowledge of plants which culminated in co-authoring two books on trees and flowers of India. So jumping back into the studio of PSD at Ayanagar, um, we had 20 to 25 designers, including trainees. It was actually a rather a large family. His enthusiasm, hard work and dedication were truly inspiring for all of us. His affable personality led him to great relationships with almost all his clients and collaborators. And this very aspect of his work ethic and his intrinsic nature is what led to the foundations of the style in which we would like to showcase the archive. We'll come to that in a few of the slides ahead. So both Vishwesh and I have been associated with PSDA for the past 20 years almost. And uh, Boss, as we had all known Pradeep as, nobody called him Pradeep really, we all know him as Boss, 
was not just our boss. He was or an, just an inspiring architect, but he was our mentor and, and a friend in many ways. Unfortunately, we lost him about nine months ago. And we thought that the least one can do is to share his large body of work, his simple but strong design ideologies to creating the PSDA archives. So when we really joined this um, uh, course on archiving about in September last year, we had our own ideas of what the archive should be and how it should be brought about. But through the whole process, it really made us narrow down, not narrow down, but at least structure what the aim and objectives of this archive could be. Because at the end of the day, in a way, it was an institutional archive. So we really came to it as to what to expect out of the archive. So there were, it was basically like a two-pronged sort of an approach. Uh, one would be to make available to the public the material related to the design projects that were done by the firm, which could be used by architecture students, for researchers, and perhaps for design studios as a, as a resource to support their practice. On the other hand, uh, we wanted to have to develop an outreach program or programs that would emerge from this body of work. And these could come out in terms of exhibitions and publications, monographs, et cetera. Yes, we do have a project timeline, which, which is very important. And uh, we had started our whole timeline, starting with the course on archiving with uh, Curating for Culture, which started in September 2020. And as you can see, all through this time, we are hoping to culminate the whole uh, thing by the, in the end of this year through an exhibition which would be held at PSDA Studio and hopefully formally launch the PSDA Studio archives. So this past few months through the pandemic, uh, Vishwesh has been handling one front of the whole archiving thing and I've been trying to kind of rummage through all the material objects that we found at the studio. And uh, I must say it has been a very endearing experience, a very emotional experience also at most times, but it has been super fun to kind of unearth a lot of things that one had forgotten about or didn't know about. Uh, and uh, it was just a great experience. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of uh, hand drafted drawings. We found a lot of slides, photographs. We have a couple of models. And I think the most exciting thing was to unearth some of uh, sketches done by Boss on the projects that have been up and running and are seen by the world today. This one sketch I found uh, particularly really beautiful and uh, very sentimental for all of us at the studio. It is uh, the first sketch, the conceptual sketch he had made for the studio itself, for the PSDA Studio Gardens, where he lists out a whole bunch of trees, fruit trees, that he had wished to pass you. And it's addressed to one of the colleagues of that time who was working on this with him. And of course, we have a huge uh, plethora of uh, a digital material, which is in the form of drawings, presentation, views, and um, working drawings. So the studio archive structure is essentially a very simple, straightforward structure so that it's easy for everybody to access as and when things uh, get on board, which basically comprises more, uh, mostly by the collection, the main collection, which would be divided project-wise or theme-wise into various categories, which I will just get to next. Uh, one category would be of Pradeep Sachdeva himself, where it would house personal documents, images and photographs clicked by him, uh, his writing work, interviews, and writings which were done on uh, Pradeep Sachdeva himself. Uh, the other head would be collaborations, uh, which would be, in fact, it's a very rich sort of a pool of experts artists and craftsperson with which we have collaborated over the past many years over all the projects that you have uh, just had a preview of. And uh, the fourth one, perhaps it's a little ambitious, but we would like to do this is to have a PSDA alumni uh, um, portion where we have PSDA alumni who where it could be an interactive platform for people to share their work and be in touch with each other. 
So the next few sheets that and the few slides that I'll share with you are uh, pretty technical and um, it's essentially to let you know that the sort of framework that we have built to fill in information from the archive. So, uh, I mean, I just thought we understood through this whole archiving uh, process uh, to the whole uh, journey of the past six months, the merit which it requires, I mean, the merit of doing this whole exercise. I mean, it's a very technical exercise, but I thought it was essential that, uh, you know, it is there so that for later on, we don't have to double up our work and start with this whole process. So uh, we, have, we have put together a data sheet, which would be essentially an information sheet or an index sheet, so to say, uh, for each of the collections, for each of the projects, which uh, houses the collection information, location, project data, and so on and so forth, which kind of houses all the basic information, which somebody can see as an overview at the first glance. We developed a collection inventory, which is a much more detailed version for all the information that an archivist uh, or, a, or a researcher or other would, uh, would, you know, would be looking for. So as you can see, I mean, it's pretty detailed. And uh, this is how one would fill in all the fields in the spreadsheet for each of the projects. And we did a file naming protocol, which clearly kind of uh, spells out how uh, the collection folder or the drawing folders or the various subfolders would be named. Again, I must say that this was, you know, like a technical exercise, which we also kind of learned through these workshops that we've attended in the past six months. And uh, there is a lot of merit in doing this right now so that later on, if everybody and everybody is, we have an archive up and running, it's simple to look for, um, look for material using keywords and tabs. So I'll just flip through these pages. This is just to show you that all the material that we have, uh, the framework that one has made for the protocol of file naming. Mm -hmm. So this is just a sample folder. Uh, we did take up space on Dropbox to create the PSDA archive where we have, it's pretty straightforward actually with these simple folders in which it houses uh, the main PSDA archive collection, correspondence, documents, etc. So to run you through perhaps one typical uh, example, we took one project and uh, named the project according to the framework that one had uh, mapped out. This is the Asighat redevelopment folder. So once you open the folder, you will be able to access these subfolders, which, um, which houses, houses different things, for example, documents or drawings or estimates and outreach and reports and presentations. So once you click on each of these, you would get to see all the material. This is the collection inventory, which I had shown you, and we have started to fill it out. And this is what the whole, all the details are going to come in over here. So I know this whole thing is a very technical, linear sort of um, process, but I thought it was essential that uh, this exercise is done given the sort of material we were dealing with document folder, drawings folder, as you can see, everything has, has a certain uh, nomenclature so that it's simple to look for drawings once we actually have the search tabs uh, going on our interface. So encounters with an architect, we, as we are saying, as I had shown you earlier in the archival structure is something that we would, we are hoping to do an exhibition of and we are working towards that which um, essentially introduces the archive to the world through some of PSDS key projects. And the interesting thing would be that these projects are presented through the stories of the key people who collaborated with Pradeep in the making of the project. So uh, just to give you an overview of the exhibition, the way we are planning it out and the way we are planning to curate it, is um, that uh, each section, each section of the exhibition would have uh, three main parts. One would be an introductory note introducing the theme or the section and giving an overview and connecting the main project being showcased. So essentially what that means is that we will perhaps suppose we have a section of say landscape design. We would like to introduce perhaps five, six projects under it and maybe focus on two or three of them and showcase that extensively in the exhibition. Uh, this could be done through uh, a set of drawings, images, and models. 
And uh, one very in, uh, interesting part of the exhibition we were wanting to incorporate is uh, an interview or an audio essay with one of the key people associated with the project. Uh, we are also hoping that the uh, exhibition could be developed as a book. These pictures on the left are of our uh, studio, the PSDS studio at Ayanagar, and the exhibition will be held over here. So um, this is the way that the sections that I was talking about, these are the broad categories that we have thought of. Um, the studio, the crafts heart, the Indian street, gardens, hotels, building institutions. So each of these sections, as I had explained, would perhaps showcase a couple of projects under the same hat. And we would in detail like to show perhaps one to two projects, which would be you know, explained through the stories of uh, a potential collaborator. These are the people who were really deeply involved with the projects. And though they know the whole process, they knew the stories behind it and the heartbreak and all the things to really see the project through on the ground. So it would be an interesting take on showcasing each of the projects through the collaborator's eyes. So, um, we were lucky to have access to an audio interview that Vishwesh took while he was doing his master's. This is about, I think, nine to 10 years ago. Uh, and in that, Boss beautifully narrates the journey of public projects done by the firm and talks about his design philosophy as well. He also talks about how he navigated the various obstacles that always come in the way of a big public project. So we would like to take this narrative for the section on public place design. As you can see, I mean, through the whole interview, one could really map the various projects, the public projects, how they came about. And of course, it's, it, would, it was all in the chronological order. To sum it up, I would just like to, um, you know, present a small audio clip in which kind, it is kind of the essence of Boss's philosophy of how he approached projects, especially public place projects. And I think this is uh, an apt way to kind of really put across his ideologies. So here goes. I think the, yeah, I it's think the, the, the other question is really about, you know, you've, uh, the way you sort of have a relationship with the client. I mean, with both of your clients, you've really had a long-term relationship even in the public domain. Uh, they keep coming back to you for more work, the same clients. Uh, yeah, so uh, there is this key aspect of you know, really maintaining a good relationship with everybody concerned. And how does that happen? And how do you sort of, you know, come with issues of conflict and things like that and still maintain yeah. a relationship? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Vishesh, I think, uh, I think there's a very simple answer to that. I think streets are important. That's what we have to remember. So we have to remember that the project, especially a, a place making project, is larger than you. It's larger than me as an architect or my ego. And if I remember that, I will try and avoid conflict because the moment you start having a conflict situation, everybody knows. You yeah. can't really get a project built. It doesn't go on. So I think that was kind of summing up what where we're coming from. And uh, as I think one can say that this whole project, it is a mammoth task that uh, one has to do because there is a lot of work that we need to put together and uh, archive it. So it's actually an ongoing process and it's an open ended process and uh, we are working on it and we'll continue to work on it till whatever it takes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Aarti. Uh, with this, I'd like to invite uh, Saman. Saman's project is called Gwalia Project, Nexus of Narrative and Reminiscence. Saman is an architect and an independent researcher holding a postgraduate degree with majors in history, theory, criticism, and minors in urban design from Faculty of Architecture, SEPT University, and the world. Saman believes in constant learning and making herself a progressive thinker. She is currently exploring ways in which the layered discourse of urban history can be understood. 
she's passionate about producing original research content through various means that adds meaning to the discourse. This interest has continually translated into the pursuit of her professional undertakings. Uh, summon over to you. Thank you, Mithu. Thank you, and uh, for everybody jo for joining in at a, on a Sunday uh, evening. I think I'll straight away uh, dive into the presentation. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, the title of the project is uh, the project is about the Gwalior city, and it is titled. It is the working title of it is Nexus of Narratives and Reminiscence. The project is a step towards uh, chronicling the past of a city with a layered and fragmented history and works with the multifarious aspect of the archival material. Uh, the project anchors itself to the question of can history be reimagined? Uh, the project primarily consists of the process of aggregating and collating the diverse range of archival material of the city about the city. Uh, this process is also an attempt to, to lay grounding for an interpretive study on the multi-dimensional aspects of uh, urban history of the city. The project is an offshoot uh, from an uh, academic undertaking where my primary role was of a historian for this. Uh, and for this project, it is of, a, uh, of an uh, aspiring archivist. Uh, my entry point for this project, uh, look at multiple sets of material that allows to identify or chalk out various entry points to understand the city's layer history. Uh, it is not only the academic engagement with the city, but personal encounters with the city. Uh, the idea of uh, longing for the city. Uh, uh, the city has led me uh, to, uh, the longing for the city, which has led me to build up this uh, project. Also, this, this naive notion that one knows enough about the city only to have encountered the plethora of material that said otherwise, uh, which keeps my rigor of observing and interpreting the diverse archival material. Uh, a very brief introduction of snippets of Gwalior history uh, to orient the audience uh, with the city. Uh, Gwalior's emergence uh, is, as a settlement originates from a development of a fort on a plateau named uh, uh, Gopachal that becomes seat of power for many decades ruled by several dynasties. Uh, from Rajputs to Lodis to Mughals and Marathas until the British takes over. Uh, Gwalior state, uh, uh, of which Gwalior city was a part of, was one of the five largest native or princely states from the total of 565 uh, uh, states during the pre-independence era. Uh, the significant ruling dynasty in Gwalior was one of the Marathas that was Shinde, commonly known as uh, the Sindhyas of Gwalior, after they accepted anglicization of the family name. The city of uh, the city for which the seat of power shifted from the plateau to plains, uh, from the forts to palaces of Sindhya, the there to civic institutions, uh, becomes an interesting case to have dealt with further to understand changes it went through. Uh, now, with these layers and with this other information comes a diverse range of archival material. Uh, I'll present a few representative pictures for a quick introduction to the kinds of material one have been looking at that includes uh, and not going into the descriptive details for each which include uh, uh, photographs books cartographic records official records uh, and objects uh, so just a very quick glance of the kind of material that one has been looking at uh, and now with this, this was having encountered the material so diverse in nature with, with encountering with encountering new materials every time one looks at one looks out, the agenda was to develop uh, strong entry points to navigate through the material bit by bit. Uh, when uh, when I'm starting and starting with uh, tagging and collating the material, uh, several patterns emerged that I worked and uh, having worked through these patterns that can engage with each other. The patterns here develops uh, from the recurring types of information uh, through the through the metadata for each of the material, and I will present each of each of these patterns with a specific example, uh, so one is able to relate uh, how these patterns have been put together. Uh, so one there are five patterns, and one of which uh, one of which is the epochs. Uh, the, the the faces marked by an unprecedented transformations that uh, reinstate the city with new questions. Phases when new ideas uh, entered into the city as influences at different moments. These phases are critical and becomes epochs in the uh, life of the city. Uh, so, for example, as seen in the picture, the construction of modern institution, which here is a, a hospital. Uh, can be seen um, as uh, as 
entering of a new idea of a new idea for modern institutions in the, into the city uh, which also uh, then uh, furthers to the notion of prog progressiveness entering to the city uh, the events events that uh, hold importance for the city that impacts the social economic cultural nuances of the city uh, for instance the setting up of a large scale uh, with setting up of a large civic square uh, sorry the setting up of the large uh, mill building and industrial state which brings in the large capital investors in the city uh, for which this is a, a print advertisement for the same uh, industry and then coming to places places that are documented and the one that remains less described places of which meanings and purposes have changed over time uh, as seen in the picture there's a it's a civic square that have been uh, have went to serving from uh, the elite to the larger pub, uh, to the larger public i'm not going into the descriptive details for each of the picture uh, but rather than uh, taking you through the patterns that have emerged from the uh, amount of material uh, and people people associated with the city uh, from the royals to the lesser known figures in the history documented through objects and materials for example here is one of the noblemen of the sindhya uh, which is a lesser popular figure uh, in the entire uh, uh, sindhya history um, and the uses uses of the material and the object uh, the way the certain materials and object becomes redundant and find a new purpose uh, here is a a tin box of a very famous uh, biscuit factory uh, of, uh, which was which came uh, to gwalior from uh, sukur in sindh in pakistan and from this these from these five patterns which they, they have helped me to navigate within the copious range of material of which you just saw a section of uh, it has also allowed me to be able to work cross dimensionally amongst the material uh, the patterns also helped me to develop uh these three themes through which i could broadly categorize the uh the material uh and and with that also uh that becomes the working title for the gwalior project that is nexus of narrative and reminiscence uh nexus that represents the interconnectedness of the material uh that many linkages of contextual information irrespective of the various sources from which the material comes from uh narratives that represent stories tales and factual snippets and reminiscence that represents materials that have become sites of memories uh for the expression of the city uh with this i'll show you the uh, the, the material which i have started categorizing in these uh in these uh, categories here are uh, the snippets from the books the uh, newsletters cartographic records that become the basis that have for me become the base to develop uh, interconnections and linkages to further understand and build up on the other material um uh, the collage here is to represent the various stories uh, related to the events and places and after putting this together what also uh, showed up uh, is that the amount of photographs of built spaces taking up more space uh, uh than the other kinds of material uh, that also comes from my understanding of build a little uh more better than the other material and for which uh, i take buildings uh as my anchor points to narrate the fragments of the history uh and then go on to the uh other kind of materials mm -hmm. and then uh, reminiscence through the ephemera through print advertisement that connects with the city uh, and as precisely uh, uh, becomes the side of memories for the uh, for the one looking um lastly to uh, conclude the the diverse material presented here have uh, acts as anchors to now dive into specific historical inquiries to understand the city's urban history uh this set of data will also be translated into a blogging format uh, to be able to keep on categorizing and collating uh, and understanding uh, the unknown uh, layers of the uh, history of the city and also the important factor that becomes uh, with this kind of representation is the kind of audiences it will engage with uh could be city enthusiasts history enthusiasts students of social studies and uh, so on uh, so yeah uh, thank you for listening in thank you saman thank you so much uh the next project is called the patni family archives it's by avni patni and dr tanatri vidhi
Avni Patni is an industrial hygienist with more than eight years of work experience in health and safety. While on a maternity sabbatical, followed by travel overseas, she got involved in translation of her great great grandfather Sir Prabhashankar Patni's books as part of the family-run trust activities. The project piqued her interest in family history and legacy of Sir Patni, the erstwhile Diwan of princely state of Harpanagar. Along with mothering her five-year-old, she is actively restoring and reviving the archival connection of Sir Prabhashankar Patni and family, and is in the process of establishing the Patni family archives. Dr. Tana Trivedi is a faculty of communication at Ahmedabad University. Her research interests are twofold: one emanating from the PhD in Indo-Fijian diaspora and poetry, and the other originating from teaching business history. And both interests conjoined by an inquiry into the archival, literary, critical, and ethnographic methods of research. Her interest in history and historiography from dual perspectives of research and teaching is what drew her towards collaborating with Avni Patni to work on the Patni archives. She also has an eight-year-old who now recognizes Sir Patni as a household name that captures the maximum attention of her mother. Over to you guys. Thanks, Mithul. Uh, thanks for a lovely introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the last session of our presentations and the last presentation of this evening. Um, we are going to do our presentation uh, through uh, the web portal, a prototype web portal that we built uh, with uh, a lot of encouragement and help uh, of uh, curating for culture, of course. Um, I will start presenting. Uh, so welcome to the web portal of uh, Patni Archives. Um, I think to start with, I'd request you all to uh, stay quiet and listen and on to this uh, audio. गरीबनी दाद सांबलवा अवरना दुख ने दलवा तमारा करण नेत्रोनी उगाडी राख जो बारी प्रणय नो वाय रो वावा कुचंदी दुष्ट वा जावा तमारा शुद्ध हृदयोनी उगाडी राख जो बारी अति उजास करनारा तिमिर नो नाश करनारा किरण ने आववा सारू उगाडी राख जो बारी थैला दुष्ट कर्मो ना छुटा जंजीर थी थावा जरा सत्कर्मनी नानी उगाडी रात जो बारी um so yeah i'm going to jump in here now and just tell you all the story about how this uh, this came about so you know abhi and i were in conversation and we were uh, thinking about the website and we were wondering you know what is a good way to begin and uh, it occurred to us that uh, sir patni uh, of course above uh, over and above uh, you know being a diwan of bhavnagar uh, the princely state of bhavnagar for for for, for a long time uh, was also a man of literature he also had uh, he's composed uh, a lot of poetry he has written a lot of works and we thought it would be best to begin uh, you know with 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 something that was close to his heart and like the poem goes right open your hearts right open your hearts and let it all in so we thought it would be best to begin um, you know like a, like an ode to sir patni and uh, that is how it happened so you know this 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 archiving this this project has actually come about through a lot of storytelling through a lot of sharing of experiences through a lot of family histories uh, and a lot of conversations that have taken place over the last 2 years actually Uh, and which all came together and culminated in a in a manner in in in, in a matter of some six eight months. Um, so I'll let Avni take on from here, and then I'll keep uh, coming in when she wants me to. Thanks, Tana. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, so now that you've all heard the Dada's, that is Sir Prabhashankar Patni's uh, poetry, Dukhi ke dar dikhe koi. Uh, i think first we would like to share with you how the idea of uh, this archives came into being so since childhood listening to stories of uh, prabhashankar dada and sir patni for all was a common affair typically at the dining table where my grandfather would narrate a lot of stories and experiences my first distinct memory of listening uh, uh, listening to and learning about sir prabhashankar patni was when i was in the grade 
three and we were uh, learning about history and I came back home and shared with my parents that we learned about Sarojini Naidu and my parents pulled out uh, an old photo album where they showed me uh, Sarojini Naidu with uh, Sir Prabhashankar Patni, Gandhiji, and all the other delegates that were attending the second uh, roundtable conference in England. And uh, the other instance that I uh, distinctly remember is when I was enrolled as a Girl Scout and my grandfather narrated, again, stories of Prabhashankar Dada of how he brought uh, scouting to Bhavnagar and how he felt it was very important uh, in the upbring upbringing of most youth and the princes of Bhavnagar since he was heading the minority administration uh, in the pre-independent India. So uh, uh, having said all this, um, Sir Patni never wanted his uh, biography to be written or he never wanted himself to be uh, glorified uh, in a manner where so even if we were publicizing his writings, not to glorify him as the personality. Uh, maybe that is why there is not much that is written about him. But uh, in 1993, my grandfather, Shashikan Patni, set up a charitable trust to ensure that his writings and works were not lost and were passed on to the future generations. And also his legacy of philanthropy and intellectual thought were perpetuated. And the trust has been running since 1993, and my parents, along with uh, Sri Privushpai Parasharya, have been managing all the activities of the trust beautifully. I got involved in the uh, translations of his books from Gujarati to English in 2017-18, when um, I started reading both the Gujarati and the uh, uh, translation scripts that came about, and my dad and me were involved very closely in editing those translations. When uh, some of the aspects touched me very strongly, wh whether it was the humanity, the value, the ethics that were so strongly exuded from the writings, or the pragmatic approach that a state administrator took in those times. Uh, I felt it had to go beyond uh, Gujarat, India, and it had to go especially to the current generation in the classrooms. And that is how um, I started meeting different family members, historians, sociologists from family, which then led to meeting uh, academicians and historians outside the family. and. Uh, one such meeting happened with Dr. Tana Trivedi. And uh, she, after a few meetings, she uh, suggested that we need to look at a lot more material to write about him afresh in English. And that is how we both uh, entered uh, the archives of Sir Prabhashankar Patni. And you will see how it is now just not Sir Prabhashankar Patni, but all the Patni archives that we are envisioning. Uh, now I would uh, now request Tana to talk about the rest of our journey before I move on to sure. the charter. Absolutely, with pleasure, Avni. So, you know, when I met Avni two years back, we did not uh, really, um, you know, uh, it was mostly about translating Sir Patni's works from Gujarati into English. And like she said, you know, taking it to the classrooms and uh, getting the younger generation um, uh, to read. Uh, about Sir Patni and what that you know his 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 thoughts his ideology, um, uh, his thoughts about administration so on and so forth, and and that's where it occurred to me that look even if I have to write about Sir Patni even if I'm translating something, uh, I do want to look at um, um, at at you know some evidences of it in the sense I would want to look at where all this is coming from, and as we got talking we realized that uh, the family. Uh, has a lot of material uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, with them, of course, because it has been passed on from generations. It's an uh, intragenerational uh, sort of a legacy. So um, as we got talking, we realized it would be a good idea to actually go to Bhavnagar, visit the Haveli, uh, and see what are the kind of records, what are the kind of papers, photographs, whatever that, that is there. And uh, that is where we actually went to Bhavnagar. Um, and when we went there, uh, it was it was a huge revelation of sorts, right? I mean, it was it was this uh, cupboard full of uh, you know it's like akin to finding gold, you know, where you it's like you open up and there's a huge treasure coming out, right? So there was there's a whole lot of papers, a whole lot of these bundles, you know, and it was so exciting for us because every bundle you would open, you would get 
uh, a, a different time, right? It would be some bundle uh, which was placed in 1920, some bundle from 1910, some from late 19th century. So, you know, uh, there was so much going on. Um, and it was about a lack of papers, right, we, which we could estimate. So it did not happen in one trip. It took, <coughs> it took us at least a couple of uh, visits to Bhavnagar to actually spending time there uh, and to just get an estimate about what we were looking at. And that's where we realized that, look, this project is not just going to be about translating Sir Prabhashankar Patni's life and works in, from Gujarati to English. It is a much larger project. Right, a much larger project which really has the capacity to open avenues into a lot of history of the princely state of Bhavnagar. So, you know, we, it was a very, very uh, significant shift for, for, for us to move from the individual to the family, to the community, to the uh, princely state of Bhavnagar, to actually even locating uh, correspondences with the national leaders and international also. So, in that sense, suddenly there was this huge uh, canvas that seemed to be in front of us. And we realized it was, uh, and also the fact that the papers were in dire need for preservation, for conservation. So even if, as, as a researcher, if I want to look at certain papers, I want to write about it, which is predominantly my interest, I would need to uh, really see them in the digital form because handling them was also becoming a huge task and and we didn't want to take chances so in fact we did not even open all the bundles we just kind of left them intact uh, so that is that is actually how it all began and then of course uh, um, last year uh, we started the workshops with um, uh, curating for culture and uh, you know that kind of got us completely into the groove right as in we were still wondering how to go about doing it you know how do we handle such a big load of papers um, and that is where ishita you know kind of and of course, everybody else was on board, kind of took us through this because clearly ours was turning out to be a very, very large project. And it still is. Um, so it's it's been a, you know, it's it's been an extremely fascinating journey so far. Uh, because both Avni and I come from very diverse backgrounds. Um, Avni being an insider uh, family, and I'm an, an outsider, you know, largely looking at from the looking at it from the perspective of a researcher. So it's been a it's been a wonderful journey so far. Um, yeah, and I, I think Avni, we should get back to the presentation. I'll go keep, keep talking about it otherwise. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Anna. Um, so uh, bringing you back to the uh, portal and to the um, uh, details about the uh, project. So here is a, a brief about uh, the family. So uh, while Sir Prabhashankar Patni played an instrumental role in shaping the social and political ethos of the princely state of Bhavnagar during the late 19th and early 20th century, his association with Bhavnagar state began when he was appointed as the companion tutor to Prince Bhav CG II during his studies at Rajkumar. College Rajkot, and then he went on to become the Divan when RCG was the ruler and served the state, country, and British Empire in different roles as an administrator, as an advisor to the princely states of India, member of Governor Council, as well as Secretary for State of India in England. So uh, while Sir Prabhashankar Patni uh, uh, played different roles, his sons, Anant Rai Patni and Bhattuk Rai Patni, continued to contribute to the princely state of Bhavnagar and others in the administrative capacity, as well as community upliftment through various initiatives. While uh, Anant Rai Patni served uh, Krishna Kumar Siji as the Divan, uh, Bhattuk Rai Patni uh, was assisting the neighborly princely states of Porbandar, Limri, and others. And Lady Patni and his daughters in law, her daughter in laws, Yashumati Patni and Savita Patni, were the backbone of the family. They were not only astute at managing and running home affairs, but also taking care of relatives, children, and well being of the larger Prashnora Nagar community. So Patni family and the trust continue to steer his legacy of philanthropy and intellectual thought while um, I am spearheading uh, the restoration and revival of heritage papers of Sir Patni. Here are some pictures to give you a glimpse of the family where uh, this is Lady Patni and Sir Patni. This is uh, his elder son Anantrai Patni and the younger son Batukrai Patni. Uh, Savita Patni, who's wife of Batukrai Patni, and here we see um, Anantrai Patni with his wife Yashomati Patni.
Next, I will quickly uh, take you through the page which talks about the trust and it gives a glimpse of the current trustees and the publications that we have and the translations that have been done so far. There are again some pictures of uh, the foundation of the trust where uh, my great grandfather, sorry, my grandfather along with the other founding members, you will see them in the pictures, an invitation of an event organized by the trust in 1995. And now I will move on to the um, archive charter where we will talk about how we are uh, envisioning this uh, uh, archive. So the objective is to not only preserve the endangered archive that is in possession of the Putney family uh, with historical collections and narratives from late 19th to, to the late 20th century spanning over three generations, but make them accessible for public engagement and academic discourse, to establish a platform and introduce the necessary resources which will encourage a culture for archiving historical narratives in the region. We want to allow for creative interpretation of knowledge systems and thereby add to the cultural development of the place and its people. So the objective, like I said, is not only to preserve the tangible and intangible histories, which have been passed on from three generations of Sir Putney, but to eventually transition it to a regional archive by setting up a resource center in the city of Bhavnagar and preserving the narratives of this region for public engagement. So this is not only about uh, Sir Putney and the family, but to uh, inculcate a culture for studying history and historical evidences uh, in the region to encourage studies, fellowship programs, to engage creative practices, and uh, in the long term, develop a framework for regional archiving and add similar collections from the region to the archive in the future. Now a snapshot of what the collection consists of. So currently, it is a vast collection of photographs, letters, documents, a whole lot of maps, plaques, stamp blocks, sketches, newspaper clippings, and which are stored in a huge cupboard in what used to be the ancestral home of uh, Sir Prabhashankar Patni in Bhavnagar. And this collection holds a lakh documents from two generations of Bhivan Sir Patni and both his sons. There are also some uh, uh, paintings, photos, venal records, and furniture. There is a large personal library collection of Sir Patni himself, which has more than 6,000 books, and they cover a very wide range of subjects. The diverse subjects which are associated with this archive have been identified. Some of them have been identified, but there are many more to this, as in when we go through the collection, will we know. Uh, the expanse of the archive ranges from regional history to subjects of national importance, like Tana said. So it is not limited to Sir Patni or the Nagar community or Bhavnagar, but it also goes to the region, the Bombay presidency, the independence movement of India, and a lot more of that of from that time. The condition of the material is uh, the papers are nearly more than 100 years old and the collection has continued to deteriorate as it is passed on from one generation to other. So we will see that they are in fragile state and need uh, conservation and preservation immediately. Some uh, Again, some pictures here to show you the collection. And as every time that we've looked at the collection, we've come across different uh, papers and objects from the collection. Uh, here is a stencil work by a Dutch painter, and you will see the variety of uh, objects that are present in the collection. This is a knighthood certificate of Sir Putney, a telegram, uh, original indices of Sir Putney's library in a catalog. Yes, so this is um, about the collection. Uh, there are a lot of activities that have been identified from cataloging to digitization to conserving the materials, preserving them. And in the uh, next, I think when we get to the latest updates, we will talk about the way forward. And uh, this is about our team where um, me as the executive director, and through this cohort, we've collaborated with Ishita as uh, a consulting archivist for us. So she has been uh, 
helping develop a lot of this and uh, we are also be uh, going to be putting out calls very soon about which i will again uh, talk in the later uh, uh, part of the presentation moving on to life and time life and times of sir patni so here we would uh, in the portal i'd like to talk about his early life and how he was uh, uh brought up by his uh, uh grandparents since he lost his mother at a very tender age and then about how he came uh to associate with prince bhav singh ji and then moved on as the diwan and the administrator and then he was um uh, knighted by the uh, british government in uh, 1915 and his relationship with mahatma gandhi where sir prabha shankar patni and mahatma gandhi were closely assist, uh, associated since gandhi ji was in south africa and their relationship strengthened after gandhi returned to india in 1915 so patni's close association with gandhi and his power to influence gandhi to attend the second round table conference in england is a proof of sir patni's overarching influence in determining the state of national politics there were several other contributions that sir patni made to the state of bhavnagar and um, he he retired from the bhavnagar state council in 1937 where he was heading the minority administration and when krishna kumar singh ji the uh, minor prince came to the throne is when he retired from the council and continued as a recovery officer to fulfill krishna kumar singh ji's desire to perpetuate sir patni's knowledge and experience amongst his staff of recovery department and uh, while he was due to participate in haripura congress along with gandhi ji on 16th of february 1938 uh, he wasn't able to attend and he passed away at shihor at the inspection bungalow on that day here are some pictures um of the ancestral home and of sir prabha shankar patni with his grandson and uh, some students at mit and with the three princes uh, during the minority administration the next pages are about uh, lady patni uh, here are uh, here is a photograph of uh, lady rama patni and the poetry which she had written for her daughter in laws when she was traveling overseas there's a letter from marani nankuwar ba to lady rama patni uh next is the page on family family heritage and legacy where we would talk about ancestors of prabha shankar patni and then the descendants of sir prabha shankar patni uh the three generations that we eventually plan to include in the uh patni archives here are some photos uh, again of uh, sir prabha shankar patni with his wife and uh family children daughter in laws and this is a picture of uh, uh, nehru and uh, vijay lakshmi pandit at breakfast with anand rai patni at his residence while they were uh, in bhavnagar for a uh, conference quickly moving to the um, archival collection so you will see that it there are some stories and narratives that we've already identified like the patnis and mahatma gandhi and then um uh, various other aspects which we know are present in the uh, archive yeah, uh, so now you want to talk about the uh, yeah, yeah. so very quickly okay i'll just take 2 minutes because i think we're running short oh. so what happened when we opened all those bundles and we had a look at a few of those papers is that we came across some large uh, topics uh that we thought we could work on to begin with there are more topics that are likely to emerge as we go through more papers but as of now we also know that the contribution of sir prabha shankar patni to the building of bhavnagar the prince state of bhavnagar is is a significant one so for instance when we look at the the, the establishment of ports and railways um so uh, you know there is a, a there are a lot of papers that have emerged from the bundles in terms of hand drawn maps of the new port uh, of the old port uh, there are a lot there is a lot of correspondence to do with uh, the building of the new port for instance and the railways for instance right um, so in that sense uh, also for instance the farmers debt redemption scheme now um, when when there was a, a drought and we're looking at early 20th century sir patni actually uh completely waived off the the loans of the farmers so you know in that sense he has been uh 
he has been a very significant administrator uh, who has contributed in in, in several ways uh, not just you know for the people of not, not just to the state of bhavnagar but in a very large context so from the point of view of the researcher it is very interesting for me to um see to to study these papers and to make connections with a larger history uh, of the state and the nation um so yeah i think we'll have to uh, i'm going to stop here with the archival collection because there is a lot that is that is emerging even now from the papers as we read um and as of now for the portal we have been able to place this much and you know uh, put it here so in fact uh, we even visited the new port of bhavnagar uh, to see how it is now so it's it's given a it's given a great sense of context for us to see uh, the the state of the city from where it was and where it is now um so yeah i think i'll um, give it to um, avni to kind of you know yeah so uh, so here is a glimpse of how uh, a photo arc a photo archive would look so there are several photos which are there in the archives and uh, one such photo of which uh, where divan anantrai patni and dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan are uh, uh, there in the picture holding uh, gandhi gandhi ji's oil painting and this was painted by oswald burley on request of sir patni where gandhi ji uh, agreed to pose for the painting and then it was done Related to the Constituent Assembly. So here is an audio of uh, our uh, senior trustee and family member Piyush Bhai Parasharya, who's uh, uh, giving the story behind the photo. Given the time, I'm not going to play this audio for now. I will go to the uh, latest. Uh, updates where we're talking about the collaboration there is a lot that has happened in the last two months uh, following um, ishita coming on board as an archivist and uh, we have a senior uh, uh, conservator who's uh, meant, uh, agreed to mentor us through setting up of the archives there have been several conservator visits that have happened in bhavnagar and they have all come and examined the collection and we are in the process of deciding uh, to go forward with the conservation every uh, visit to the archives has uh, brought up uh, new findings and objects that we every time come upon and that's why i say the treasure hunt continues because i'm not sure what treasure i'm going to come upon every time i go uh, visit the archive and open up things uh, here is a bunch of keys that uh, do not belong to any cupboards and uh, then a lot of furniture ready for uh, restoration these springs which have come out from old sofas which are now getting renovated very interesting things that uh, come up every uh, at every visit and then the, the other developments that have happened is family across the globe is connecting for the archives and to give in their suggestions and contribute so uh, it it is a wonderful experience that way uh, a future roadmap uh, we're look we have a three year plan uh, laid out and we're looking at primarily at conservation and the setup of the infrastructure in the second year we would focus on the preservation both in physical and digital terms so uh, and then in the third year we look at setup of an online resource portal and making the data accessible for which we will need a lot of collaborations and support so we are looking for support in terms of funds and approaching uh, grant awarding bodies and we are shortly going to open out calls for an archival record manager an archival assistant and oral historians to record stories from uh, uh, several family members across uh, gujarat mumbai delhi and also few overseas so these are our updates and lastly the um, acknowledgments um, so we are grateful to all the academicians historians scholars family members and individuals from the community who have guided us and shared experiences stories narratives and thus given impetus to in the inception of patni archives uh, our heartfelt gratitude to curating for culture and a special thanks to ishita and vallabhi for all the hand holding that you've done throughout the process and also all the four co curators for their uh, valuable insights all your workshops were very uh, informative and we thank all the constructing personal archive cohort members 
Uh, we would like to thank Professor Aditya Kant, the art conservator from Ahmedabad University, and Soham Patel for their interest, time, and advice in their respective uh, subjects, which have helped us come along. And uh, the translators, as well as uh, historian Ushakan Mehta and Piyush Pai Parasharya for participating in oral history interview. And finally, thanks to Hitar Joshi and Maitrei Patni for assisting us with the website design and the photographer for editing photographs at the last minute for us. So yeah, that's about it. And thank you for staying on. I know I've exceeded the time limit a little bit, but yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Avni. Thank you, Tana. Uh, it's quite an extensive bit of work you've been able to do of this more than extensive project uh, you've been handling. Uh, with that, I think we come with the, at the, to the end of the four project presentations. And we have about 40 minutes for us to have conversations with the participants regarding the project. If you have any questions, uh, Sita, would it be wise to pause here for a couple of minutes for everyone to take in the presentations and come up, gather their thoughts uh, regarding them? Yes, I think that that sounds fair. I think these have been very expensive uh, and very detailed projects. So even even while I was listening to it, I could feel that everybody might need a minute or two. So maybe two minutes. Uh, Everybody can gather their questions, thoughts, and write the question either in the Google document or in the chat. Uh, we should be able to take questions from the chat as well. Even comments are welcome. I think we can build on comments and uh, build conversation from there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll take a couple of minutes, and uh, as soon as we're back, we begin our conversations. See you in a bit. Hey, this is uh, this is just a question to the to the team, not not anybody in particular. But <clears throat> once this is all all done, I hear music. Can everybody hear me? We can. Yes. Yeah. So, say for example, I I daughter she we we have kind of moved overseas, and she wants to look into this and understand her, you know. Our ancestry and all that. How does one, how does one access all this wonderful work that you guys are putting? How does one access that? And the second part of the question is, uh, how does anybody who does not know Sir P and and what he did, uh, how does he show up if somebody is doing a search? in I don't want to, I don't want to trivialize this by calling it Google search, but if somebody's looking for something uh, particularly in the area of you know excellent administration being 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 a good politician but at the same time being empathetic how, how does sir Putney's name show up uh to the public in general and second the first one of course is how do how do our you know the, the children get uh, get get access to that Do we did if you want to take this up? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so uh, Kaka, I think uh, once we develop our, um, our portal and once we have our work done about cataloging and getting, this is a prototype portal that we've put out. But then eventually, once we have the authenticated data, then there will be a proper portal which is published and put up. And so then there is valid data that the family can look at. And how how does it show up in, in searches for for the general public? Uh, I mean, I mean is, is there a potential to have these you know shared with the university so that some of this uh, can be shared? So, so if I can just quickly answer that question. So you know when um, once the uh, the process of archiving is going on, uh, we also plan to keep writing about Sir Patni. So my my role there is also to keep researching and writing. So as we also publish and we keep writing, uh, it'll. I'm, I'm presuming it'll also be then. It'll also show up on Google. It'll also be accessible. Uh, you know, for instance, if we uh, create a sort of, some sort of a blog post, or if we create some sort of an online, uh, you know, some other space where we can showcase some of his work. So I'm presuming as we go by and we keep working on his, uh, you know, the materials that uh, keep coming up the presence will increase online and that is where the accessibility will also come in 
So once even the website goes live, we will also have links which will be on the website, which will also connect to different other websites. I'm, I'm you know, through that, uh, I'm sure the visibility will increase. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, uh, th thank you very much for those answers. And, and, and I think that there's a huge potential to even share this with universities across the planet, uh, because his, his, some, of, some of the things that he did uh, was, was completely outstanding. Even in even in those years, so something to think about, and you guys might have already thought about it. I'm just I'm just brainstorming on a Sunday morning. Sure, thank you. Uh, do any of the other participants from the other sessions have anything to comment on? Have any questions they want to ask regarding the presentation done here? Meanwhile, I think we have a question for Saman. Um, I don't see who is written it. Would Would you like to read it out for yourself? Do you Do you want me to read it? Um, this is uh, Sona here. I hi, have Sonal. yeah. Hi. Um, I can read out the question. Uh, it's like a long winded question, but um, it's uh, because Saman showed a large, it's a huge amount, a vast amount of data. And it navigates a lot of territory in terms of content and things like that. So I'm one of the questions that she's also asking herself through her presentation is how do I curate all, all of that? So uh, I, I was wondering if, uh, I mean, have you, like in your curation, how are, you, how are you bringing out this idea of the privilege versus, you know, the stories that are collected by the privileged within the archives? With their uh, to forge their own, you know, presence and for the future. But within the archives, we tend to sometimes within those stories find that there there are hidden or in between stories of the underprivileged. And I and I was wondering if that can be your entry point into curating this vast amount of data. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think this question also of accessibility of how much is accessible and how much is in uh, the public domain then also connects back to the question. Uh, so this, I have not been thinking about the privilege and the uh, uh, the amount of privilege that comes with the archive, but can surely become an entry point to then uh, take this lens and look at the amount of material as to what is uh, pointing towards the privilege of the archive itself and uh, what are the things that has been missing? What are the gaps that one can address with this sort of curation that, okay, this is, it's all there and these are the things that uh one needs to still uh get on to this is uh so yeah i think this is something that is uh that can be built up and that would be a very interesting uh point and then to also come back to the question of uh the urban history where a lot of accessible information is all there a lot of questions that keeps on reiterating themselves about the cities and about the four layers or the five layers that one keeps on iterating and look uh, and in general the scholarly uh, material that is available. So I think yeah, this is uh, I I don't know how to iterate it right now, but yeah, this is something that to, to dwell upon. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. There's another question which seems to be an extension of it, a little more in general. Uh, the person asks, how does one generate interest in culture and history in those who are not interested? Somehow these exercises remain among the educated and elite, limiting its impact. Uh, I think I'd leave this question open to anyone who would want to. So, Vitu, let me go. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, like, I'm very, because I was very taken by what you said the other day, you know, when we were discussing, saying that, you know, we need to really look for newer ways to reach out to the general public. And, you know, uh, website is, of course, one, one place where we begin. Uh, exhibition is another thing. But we really live in times which are extremely dynamic and very interesting. And they also offer a lot of platforms and technology for us to uh, explore different ways in which we can reach out to the younger generation, especially, um, and make uh, history accessible and interesting. And for somebody like me who absolutely finds history very, very fascinating, it's always been a big question saying, why don't people like history? Why don't we really like to engage with history? You know, 
and uh, uh, of course i wouldn't blame the schools for it but uh, i would like to as much as i would like to but you know i i really think that we need to find creative ways uh, to to reach out uh, and and really history i mean uh, we are not saying that we bend the facts you know we we keep them the way they are but the way we take them uh, to the world uh, i think we can find a lot of scope there so uh, there are several ways in which we can get people interested uh, i think uh for instance reaching delving into history through folklore uh through music through art you know through storytelling um that that works storytelling always works i think so at least that's what avni and i have also been discussing saying we need to get more stories out right um so maybe i don't know if this answers partly the question and you know somebody might also want to add to it that you know that reminds me of a conversation uh, you and me had arti uh, regarding how at this stage the primary audience for the psda archives is architects designers and researchers but we discussed how these are not the only stakeholders uh, when it comes to these archives uh, he's done a number of public space designs where you know anyone who is accessing those places right now is a stakeholder and is that a possibility to then introduce those people to the kind of work he's done throughout his life and maybe in the same space uh, so not to pressure on you to you know develop the project further but also just wondering in is that a possibility in fact uh, this discussion that we had the other day really left a uh, seed in my mind and absolutely correct that this is not something only to be focused for researchers and students or people related only to the design field i think it should be available to anyone who's interested perhaps to know more about uh, suppose if somebody even if wants to know something about say the chandni chowk redevelopment project or something may not be a designer may not be a researcher or anything from that but uh, yes we would like to when we actually present the archive up on the public platform uh, we would like to take that into consideration and uh, make it accessible to anybody who would want to see the works and of course if somebody wants a detailed thing then they contact the main archive office and get the you know detailed information etc but yes definitely to keep it open for um, everybody to see and enjoy Well, so to 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 capitalize on what Arthi just said, yeah, this does not have to be just a research project, and and Avni and the and the, and the team has done a fantastic job. But like for example, uh, like my mama Shashi Khan Patni used to always tell me, you never stop learning, uh, boy, and and that has stuck with me. So I would like to know that how did he negotiate getting the port approved for Bhavnagar when he was up against Mumbai? The the just it was I think just called Greater Mumbai. Jaywant Bhai or somebody, if anybody knows about it, but how did he manage to do that? Now that's that's like you know for the entire country, he he was he did a, he did a stellar job, and I would like to know what were his negotiation negotiate uh, negotiating skills. That is something that you know that our generation, the next, the next, the next can can leverage from. I think that that's where the value would be as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the reason. Uh, sorry. Tan okay, Tanay, you can finish. No, no, no. Please go on. Please go on. No, no, no. Uh, the previous question about you know reaching people who are not uh, directly interested in culture and history uh, was posted by me. Sorry, I didn't put my name there. Uh, but uh, the reason why that question came to me was I have told this to Avni also. Is that actually during Avni's wedding there was a driver for one of the taxis. who saw one of the books of sir p being distributed amongst uh, the relatives and uh, came and asked my husband for, for that copy and he said i want this because uh, i want to talk to my family about it i've heard a lot about him now uh, i suddenly and and i've also heard of you know my mommy going to town to buy you know um, um, regular stuff in the market and people knowing who she is and suddenly acknowledging and uh, talking to her in that way now these are people i don't think they visit museums or even archives or you know things like that would never come on a google meet like this so that is where my question comes that but there's still people who may want to learn history in a very different way you know in a very in a much more personal 
way the way it's impacted their lives i'm sure their lives have been impacted otherwise you know they wouldn't be interested so that is where i'm coming from i mean uh, and i also see that in india we have i mean no one i mean it's really, i know that a lot of people are working to revive museums and libraries and things like that but it's a real uphill task no one walks into a museum in india you know so uh, i mean that's that's where i'm coming from uh i think to respond to that question the way i look at archives i think that's the beauty of an archive which it doesn't have one narrator uh the number of people working on an archive with their own viewpoint can build multiple narratives which are accessible to very diverse kind of an audience right uh john i mean the case of uh, ps the patni archives avni you go in to this working with the archive with a connection with your family tana has a very different interest point in this archive right similar i'm assuming would be the case with uh, arti and vishwesh you both work with the same studio but that doesn't mean it has to be you look at it in the exact same way uh so i think the amount or the plethora of archival material that we have the multiple multiple narratives that can be built uh and not one important or better than the other uh just very diverse and very different i have a question from ashita here would you want to ask the question yourself ashita so in fact before i uh, go on to that question i am actually interested in um, extending shwetal's question to um, kamal given that we are right now talking about a certain context um and when shwetal is making the comment it is about india in particular if i might uh, assume that and i i hope i'm right shwetal so kamal while you are working with history of your family um and your ancestry which is otherwise rooted here but your exposure and your understanding of the museums and you also teach your students about archiving and museum would be very different because the appreciation in that part of the world is very different than here how would you respond to the concern that i think what shwetal is raising is is something that we all in arts and culture think about and then we and then we move on because we think we still have to do what we have to do so mm -hmm. kamal would you sort of reflect sure um i think i think for me i actually consider myself this is why i was so interested in this story of nagam um krishna rao cuz i actually consider myself an educational activist and so i've been working in education for 20 years and so i i've been very interested in just um you know my parents migration and how like class mobility works and you know i think a lot of people as they shift classes their perception of like their heritage their roots also shifts or they hide things and so i think um like i didn't actually growing up i didn't even know what my caste was and my mom told me different answers and so i wanted to figure out myself but the reason what what got me to do this is in the diaspora is like i think um like right now there's a huge movement amongst bangladeshi feminist activists in the diaspora that grew up over there and then are here and there's a huge movement among dalit activists here and so i think um that's coming through in museums and everything and so i think also for me most of my education work has been and a lot of it is influenced by seeing social inequality when i was little in india i was deeply affected by the poverty that i saw and so when i came to the us i my education activism really like went towards um thinking about social inequality in the US. And so I think it's always like a conversation back and forth. And so I I've ended up working in a lot of um like like communities that are not Indian. And actually Indians don't choose to be public school teachers in America a lot of times. And so like I was always a very unique person so I would be working in a uh, low income neighborhood in brooklyn and i'd be teaching rangoli and so they they were very excited to have this like indian teacher and so you know i also you know post 911 
I was bringing in like a Sikh activist to talk about Islamophobia. So I think it's very, very intersectional at all moments and you have to really look at how power structures are operating all the time and how you're communicating and so for me that's why i think it's the object it's the artwork it's the photograph and i'm much more apt to not use literacy but to use the more sense sensorial aspects of the archive to engage because i think actually even people that are literate they want to be activated through their senses first and so i think um i i don't even i think every single just from working in so many communities i think every single human being is engaged in culture and history at all moments and i think my project actually showed me like the way that the telangana people had been oppressed it's like oh wow even my own culture that i didn't even know was basically stereotyped and put aside and it and literally after um the state was split then then festivals were allowed to come through people were more proud so what happens when we make those shifts and we really don't i'm i'm really into like the work that i do is really really about um like decentering the canon and every time i write a curriculum i say well, how does this sit with this so i love curricula writing and i and i always think about how everything's sitting even just the narration of knowledge if you're creating an educational space is super super important like how much weight are you giving to something versus something else what are you showing who's speaking who's not speaking so i think of all these power dynamics all the time Thank you, Kamal. Um, Mithil, I'm stepping into your space, but I, I still want to extend this question because what it now does is perhaps um, hints so much towards what Kamal said uh, into the whole need for um, localizing the archive, if I, if I might use that phrase. I don't think uh, the verb is correct. But so Avni and uh, Saman, if uh, you both could uh, reflect on this point or rather critique it when I'm saying that maybe we were doing history wrong until now and what your projects are proposing is to make history relevant to the people whom it matters rather than than always uh, hope for that institution for the national narrative to take over uh, in terms of uh, establishing the relevance of an archive or history or culture. Uh, if I may step in, uh, if I have understood it uh, correctly, it is about it is a question of uh, how are we uh, reimagining it. If 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 you're if you're thinking on those lines, and how how are we um, uh, using the archives to be able to reach to a different kind of audience uh, as to as to uh, where it have reached a certain kind of audience, and now we are. Trying to change the way it is, uh, it is understood, or trying to change the way it is interpreted, uh, and yeah, that is that is what the projects can do, or maybe are trying to do in some sense. Uh, but it is, it will also, it is not only the effort of of the person who is archiving, but also the, uh, it is also more of a, uh, how do we, if I may use this term, as to behavior change of looking towards uh, some things. Uh, uh, to a certain project like this, so I think that also. So it has to be a. Uh, uh, there are many stakeholders for this. Then it it cannot be a, a single person or the curators or the archivist to whichever role one is in. Uh, so that also has to be done, and that can be negotiated uh, through collaborations, uh, through understanding who are the stakeholders who wants to become these stakeholders. I think that's. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I would like to add. Yeah. Yeah, I think to add to what someone is saying is collaborations and uh, keeping in mind the audience. So I think Shwetalwen brings a very important aspect that when we are designing and when we are thinking about our audience, it's important that we look at this audience who is going to be more familiar with the local language. So that primarily is something that we've also been trying to do in each of our initiatives, make sure that we are also talking in Gujarati in our presentations and reaching out to people. And then collaborating with the locals, like not just doing things with uh, academicians and historians across the globe, but to make sure that that presence is in the uh, happening locally also, like 
uh, I know that there is a Bhavnagar Heritage Preservation Society and we have the founder uh, in our invitee list too. So there are a lot of initiatives they are doing locally, like involving the uh, children from the school in heritage walks, training them, getting them to do painting. So the local uh, um, uh, public is getting involved. The citizens are becoming aware. And when we collaborate with bodies like this and others in the region and in the city, then uh, these kind of initiatives will get momentum and go to the larger uh, audience. So that is how that is what we will keep in mind. And like our charter says that we will look at creative practices. So we want more collaborations. We want more people to bring in these new angles to reach out to a wider audience. Thank you, Avni and Saman. Um, so I'll come to my point because I think now it's the perfect uh, the question, the main question, which is a good time to ask that all these four projects which we saw um, um, they deal with involving and inviting more members on board. And this is the flip side of the question that uh, Richa had asked in the previous se um, session, where when you're building a community, you are, you're more in, I mean, let's let, maybe not more inclusive, but yes, it's a more participatory process when you're involving. Whereas in your case, it's an institutional setup. Um, ultimately, these archives have to become a body of its own and everybody coming in uh, is really going to give in their two bits, but they still become outsiders perhaps. So how are you dealing with biases or opinions of different members whom you're inviting on board or uh, interacting with uh, in terms of building and looking at your archives? And this is for all four projects. If I may speak first. So in fact, our, uh, one of the major uh, parts of the archive is about collaborating with others and showcasing uh, Pradeep Sachdeva's work through their vision, through their eyes. Now, I think this, uh, this so-called trust that we are having and putting it in the hands of that certain collaborator is all through uh, an unexplained relationship that has been there between Pradeep Sachdeva, between the project and between them, whether they were the client or the collaborator or one of the stakeholders. So we know, we are confident of that strong bond which has been there and uh, the connection that they have with the project. So we are actually letting our faith in them to be able to showcase and talk about uh, the project and form the narrative of, the, of that particular project. So I think it's all about uh, having faith and uh, letting them know because this is not something which is selfish or your own or my opinion or your opinion. It's an open thing and it's open to interpretation and design is anyway such a subjective field. So it's just we are going to just present it out there and it's for whoever to see the way would, they would want to see it. So um, that is the way that we had approached this whole, uh, you know, this whole thing. I think I would like to add is say that uh, to make the archives and to uh, uh, tell the people who are interested that they are uh, cross-dimensional or uh, they have uh, they can be used with with multiple meanings or cannot be, because archives in general uh, this could be a problematic statement but in general is uh, is looked by a certain section of people and uh, what we are what with this program also is trying to be extending it to a very, as you say, I can use this word again, uh, in a manner which reaches each and every one, uh, to each and every one. So I think this whole uh, sense of extending the archives uh, becomes important in such cases, and especially when uh, uh, Tana is setting up, so uh, setting up an archive which is accessible to public. Uh, so I think uh, there's this question of accessibility also comes and also uh, with accessibility, who is uh, the largest stakeholder, who is the owner. And with all these questions, this idea of making the archives available to the, or uh, uh, having this, uh, making the archives available to the larger public and to the, and uh, telling them that it is, it can be used uh, comes from the conviction of the person who has the larger stakes. So I think uh, if, if I'm making sense uh, at this point of time, so yeah, this, this is uh, this is I want to uh, iterate this uh, whole notion of um, how do you localize the archives or things like that, because uh, the, the, the stakeholdership also should not be taken away from the person who has done the larger work. 
so how does one navigate in that space and can then can then still be uh, can then still be localized can then still be reached out to the larger public and maybe because of these certain interconnections or these complexities that is not reaching to the larger audience uh, and of course there is no uh, uh, you're not questioning the how it, how much accessible how much in public domain but this whole complex web that one has to navigate the power structures that one has to navigate to be able to uh, just look or just uh, uh make sense of the uh, archive materials so yeah i could um i think i think one thing for me i think with my own work and then also the way i teach teach how we look at the archive is i think methodologically I, i'm always telling people to go slow actually and to work really slowly and i work really slowly and so i think that's why i spent I, I was grappling with the fact that like during the pandemic so much was happening so I couldn't actually connect with Nagam Krishna Rao's family and I also have language barriers so I would have to depend on my mom and cousins in India so I said you know if if he his family can't speak on it like what what can I do outside of you know their their words and so i think for me it was like so what's my position i can look at the photos and i'm a photographer i teach photography so i'm like let, let me look at the photos and let me see how deep i can get with these actual photos and so i think what happens is that something that you might see as a um disservice might actually become your service it might actually become the center of your archive and so it's like, I think, what is my role as a photographer? So that's my entry point and into these photographs. So I think like um, going slow is one thing. And then also like really thinking about audience, I think like, does, does every archive have to go public? So I've thought a lot about these photos, like, you know, just cause I'm dealing with people who've been killed. So I said, you know, who, who are these lives and who are these people? This, I, I also like, took my time looking at the photos and didn't read the literature because I found the literature to be really on like almost like schizophrenic like on two sides and so I felt like okay instead of getting involved in the politics of it why don't I first just look at the photos and what what are they telling me so I think you know I think that's um that there's like methodologies that you can use that can take away from um you getting too caught up into the outcomes, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's like maybe maybe everything doesn't need to be seen to the public. Maybe it just needs to be seen with the family or with the community. Maybe it's just for the community. Sana, I think you want to say something. I see your hand raised. Uh, did I raise my hand? No, sorry. I think. Ah, uh, okay. Really but good. yeah, Sana or Avni, if you want to add to it, otherwise, uh, Mithul, the handle is back to you. Yeah, I think uh, there is a yeah, go on, Abdi. So just, I think uh, uh, when Aarti was speaking and both Kamal were talking, so there are fine lines that, I mean, every stage has had biases and we've had to come over it. And uh, I think uh, uh, earlier when we were having a conversation with Mithul, he said that, you know, as an archivist, you are playing a very small role there. So uh, the, everybody has the choice to make interpretations and your job is to uh, do the work and bring it forth. So I guess keeping that in mind uh, helps you stay aligned and deal with all the biases that come along. And yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, we have a question by Rosemary. Uh, would you like to unmute and ask it yourself? Or do you want me to read it out? Um, sure. Is the background noise too much? No, we are sure. hearing okay. it <laughs> um, Just as a general question to anyone who wants to ask, um, while archiving your objects, um, what were some of the limitations and challenges you face prioritizing objects? I know once you get past the like hundred into the thousand marks, um, time just becomes an issue and like digitalizing objects and images versus um, being able to actually preserve and house objects within a physical archive. And just how did that affect your projects? Uh, so, Rosemary, I can go on that first, maybe, uh, because we did have a lot of uh, material objects which was there at the studio. 
And uh, just to give you a small example, we do have rather large sheets, which potentially needs to be scanned. But you see that is a very, um, te not a tedious, it's a very expensive affair. So really we can't be sitting and scanning each of those drawings. So what we did landed up doing was we were just simply um, clicking a photograph just through a simple phone so that I have at least a thumbnail of a picture to kind of tie it up to the uh, sheet that I was putting together, uh, kind of, you know, listing out all the various objects that I had. So what we are doing right now is just literally clicking a picture of it. And eventually, whenever the archive does see the light of day, and in case somebody wants to access that particular drawing, uh, then is the time when we could actually go through the, you know, professional way of scanning it or uh, photographing it in a professional manner to have it accessible to whoever requires the thing. Um, it is, it is a very tough uh, call to take as to what are the objects you prioritize. So what we are doing right now is just um, literally keeping everything in a systematic manner. And once we have everything on hold and how we structure the objects, the material objects of the archive, I guess then we'll come to it as to how to, um, you know, really digitize it and keep it as a, a, a proper record. Our aim right now is just to keep it safe and to keep it well so that it does not get damaged. So that is, I think, the number one priority, at least when you're starting off to deal with material uh, objects. I hope I answer, <laughs> got to answer some of that for you. No, but I, I, I think it's really interesting just thinking of Arthi's project, like the amount of work that went into it and just, I, I was just like, wow, I could never, I'm like, I'm. what made me think is like, I'm not that type of archivist. <laughs> and so I think it's like, it's really, really fascinating. And I, I was like, oh, that's how, you know, like if they didn't make this initiative, then I feel like it does kind of make it official. So I think so much of archiving is really also, how do I make these people or these, these stories official. So it's like, how do we make it something that people engage in? How do we care for it? And I think, um, yeah, I think just like that labor that you're doing is is really, really um, important. But I, I know I definitely don't work that way. So for, for me, the priority is really, I think, because I come from more the lens of an artist, I'm trying to think about what is a story that I'm trying to tell. So I'm like, as long as I have enough to tell the story, I'm okay. And then the rest can be dealt with later. Yeah, I think in our case, it's a mammoth of a task, which we haven't really got into yet. It's just a very small sample that we've looked at. We've photographed and done whatever we've managed because a lot of our material is also in a very sensitive state. So handling them and getting to it is a question, but it we can't proceed without it is what I've realized. So we will have to identify and make the basic list first, then to decide what needs to be conserved, what needs to be preserved, and then we move ahead. So it is an inevitable part of archiving. Yeah, yeah I think when we started the project, we really did not anticipate material objects. It was largely, you know, only photos that we were looking at. And then we realized there is like 6,000 books and then there's furniture and then there is painting and then you know it's like one thing after the other so yeah the scope just became larger so i think to take a leaf from the previous presentation if we were to all agree the archives archiving is an unending process uh i think with that as an agreement how we decide to prioritize objects to digitize objects really depends on the intent of what your next step is with how you want to disseminate the archive, right? Uh, I mean, it, otherwise it could just go on and on. And the reference to what Avni mentioned of the importance or how we place ourselves as archivists in, in relevance to the archive. We are, I mean, the way I look at it, we are something that pass. The archives are still going to remain after us. And the best we can do is put it out there <clears throat> for no, no, bala, bala. No, no. so many people, as many people as they are okay. who can interpret them. Uh, I think that just brings me to a very uh, line that has stuck with me where, where Teju answers the question of what is, Teju Cole answers the question of what is the importance of you know, an archive. And he says, what we leave behind is uh, what's left for the future generation to interpret. 
with all senior hair on my head i am the senior most member of our patni family <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i'm proud of uh, being with uh, you uh, today and a uh, lot of things have been discussed i am proud of you all and now uh, because of this one uh, patni archives we have now extended family of patni uh, because we have extended all of you with uh, this uh, great uh, great extension of our family uh, so many good things are talked about uh, dada ji and uh, so many good things are very much there and uh, uh, i have come across some of the files and uh, each uh, each paper contains a story behind it uh, either it is uh, by prabhashankar patani or anantray patani all the correspondence carry some story which gives us uh, some good uh, information and also one has to uh, know about uh, who's who that should be the background of each and every reader Uh, while going through this uh, files also and also to write some story about it so i had a good opportunity to write about uh, ambalal sara bhai and uh, anantray patani the correspondence between two that is also a very good story and uh, so many good things are there and uh, dada ji i am talking about prabhashankar patani uh, he used to uh, go through each and every page of the book not that he has left uh, 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 from half all like that each and every page he has uh, seen read and he has also put a remark pdp which is green uh, ink or red ink like that so not that he was keeping all this 6000 books is not in a figure to know about but plus those pages multiply but those pages he has gone through all those pages not he was not only that he was maintaining a good library but we are proud of that that he has read all those books page by page it was a great thing thank you thank you thank you thank you uh we can take the large last uh, comment from vicha and then uh, over to you vishita is that okay please vicha you were saying yeah uh, actually it's it's not a question uh, it's just a sort of a, a reflection uh, that i take the liberty you know to voice out <laughs> that uh, it's interesting i mean i am stunned looking at all these personal archives and i question uh, you know people who have chiku one second and i and i uh, and i really wonder that uh, if if i were to you know uh, like like why why did i not make like why did i not look at my grandmother or my grandfather or or my great grandfather and what is it that stopped me or why was i not motivated in that direction and for those who were motivated in that direction uh, it it is indeed a huge amount of you know uh, responsibility or recognition or uh, you know respect for that legacy uh, that you have chosen to kind of take upon and uh, and it's it's amazing it's amazing so it's actually like you know truly dotting those lines and you know uh articulating the uh, your own past and and in the sense and that is that is the stand that you take and you choose to you know like you know like yeah like we were speaking in the earlier session the transference the responsibility of transference so and i, I really wonder why did i not choose that with my family <laughs> i don't know why <laughs> so amazing thank you thank you so much thank you Uh, too much to learn so yeah thank you i think there's a really good question to end uh, today evening with uh, before i hand it over to ishita i really like to congratulate again all the participants who presented over these four sessions and you deserve a, you know an applause so please do that for yourselves and for everyone else and uh, congratulations again to ishita wallabi and the entire team uh, to have successfully seen through this mammoth of a project and a program uh, thank you over to you ishita um many thanks to you mithul and all the participants of the session a big thank you to all of you in the audience and i'm it's a pleasure to be to have witnessed all of these projects to be a part of you know the process of the making of these projects and i'm really 
grateful that you know i learned so much from you all so good bye and over to you shita i can see how everybody is not even able to complete their last sentence <laughs> and i'm still going to request everyone to give me five more minutes uh, and i want to close with something to say uh because reflections are inevitable right especially after such two days of inspiring celebrations uh, um and but these celebrations as much as they were about the arrival i would like to emphasize that the celebration must also be about the journey that we have all taken together in times when the world had stood still um circa 2020 and we were all trying to make sense of the uncertainties this cohort came together with their individual purposes but also towards a cause which now speaks for a collective if the world was grappling with unprecedented situations it wasn't an easy and smooth ride for either of us so many of us in this group have faced loss of a close one or been primary caregivers at some point through these months someone was affected by covid-19 some others have dealt with family crises It is so motivating to think of constructing Personal Archives 2020 as a place which has allowed us to share, grieve, and heal through these strange times. There was room for response as well as silence, enthusiasm as well as slowness, criticality as well as romanticism, and imagine all of this through a digital interface. So, speaking for myself, I have greatly underestimated the screen and the power of technology. or the web until now i still remember that wednesday in september 2020 very clearly water had locked in the basement power was cut off for hours and i had to cancel my first interaction with this cohort while i was apologetic and frustrated i received a message from tana who is in amdavad asking me if everything was okay and if she could help me in any way i am in bangalore more importantly she doesn't know me or we have even we have not even interacted yet but such unconditional empathy marked my start of this program needless to say that these new experiences across the screen have only grown over the months vallabhi who has been the backbone of the program but for me personally i could share with her and unwind the most stressful situations while she is herself dealing with her own complexities thank you will not just do justice so i hope that i will find a better way to express my gratitude to you vallabhi yohan messaging me about his delight as when the collaborations would get stronger for his archive or interaction with the kids joshua and agastya or even mevish and kamal's cats during the digital interactions or simply feeling nostalgic about my conversations with my late grandparents which remain unrecorded because i wasn't an aware historian in those days i don't have time to count all such experiences but i can vouch for each one of the participants journey has influenced me personally we have shared personal spaces over email whatsapp google meet group forums as well as on one on one communication even the co curators have reached out and helped or communicated with us very freely it wasn't all very professional and furthermore i'm going to take liberty to speak for the group that it has affected us collectively so to an outsider it might feel like we made use of an opportunity or the participants put their free time to better use but i think a more honest representation of this experience would be in accepting that we perhaps redefined the word personal because somebody kept asking me how did we name this place personal and i think we might have started somewhere but we ended somewhere else we learned to connect and belong in much newer ways through one of the most transforming years with that a deep gratitude or a deep sense of gratitude to all of you audience participants co curators vallabhi and i don't know i mean there must have been so many other factors of the universe which has made this happen thank you very much for this enriching experience and believing in us i wanted to end with that <laughs>